So welcome back everybody for another webinar organized by Princeton for everyone worldwide. We're very happy to have uh, Chang Tai She with us. Hi, Chang Tai. Hey, Marcus. Chang Tai will talk about two strong hands, China's vision of the private sector. So we're looking forward to learn a lot about China and the vision that the Chinese government has for its economy. When I think about hands, I think about invisible hands by Adam Smith. And I was wondering to what extent strong hands or a strong hand destroys uh, the invisible hand. And typically invisible hands you can associate with the price signal. It's a conveyor of information about the scarcity of a particular product or an asset and the future cash flows or what it pays off. So one is the marginal utility, one is then the payoff. And if you have too much, or if it's an interventionistic hand, but then the price signal might not depend necessarily what the information is about, about the underlying fundamentals, about the cash flows and so forth, but it might be much more signaling what the government will do in the future. And I've done some work with the Wei Xiong and Microsoft and where we really uh, focus uh, on that. We're saying actually once the investors think mostly what will the government do, what government intervention will come, they are zoom in on collecting information about that and the price only signals about future government interventions rather than the cash flows and that actually might distort resources uh, down the road. Now that's essentially if you have strong hands, but more generally, if you have uh, China's model, if you think about it as a government, if uh, you might want to control the commanding heights, that's uh, how Lenin put it. And Lenin said, okay, you don't have to control the whole economy. You just have to control the commanding heights consisting of strategically important sectors like public utilities, natural resources. And I would say platforms, which are now in the new world with the data is, is part of the commanding heights like Alibaba and Financial, Tencent and others. So that's essentially where probably uh, Tangja will go today. And one other challenge for China is essentially whether it will be caught in the middle income trap or not. So we know that if when economies catch up with the advanced economies, initially it's a very different uh, process because you just have to copy essentially what the advanced economies are doing. But once you're at the frontier, you have to do your own R&D and you have to have a very different economic structure. So the switch over from being a you know, from trying to catch up, from being at the frontier and pushing the frontier is very different. And you might be trapped if you don't manage this switch over, so you don't have the resilience uh, in a sense if you don't manage the switch over. And there's some examples where, you know, people escape this middle income trap. And if we go back in the 19th century, you can actually compare Imperial Germany when Imperial Germany in the 19th century tried to catch up with the UK, and similarly, the US was trying to catch up with the UK, while China is catching up with the US now and then you know, being potentially caught in a middle income trap or not caught. But what's striking essentially is that there's a lot of similarities between Imperial Germany in 19th century to China today. So Imperial Germany actually was trying, it was a landlocked uh, empire, so it, it tried to build, you know, railways and this famous Berlin backed up railway. And if you go to Istanbul, you see, you know, still a lot of the remaining parts of these railways. And the Belt and Road Initiative is essentially a similar concept, um, what China is doing now. There was also a lot of attempts to acquire new technological uh, knowledge. And that's the same thing what China is doing now. There was, you know, your, the way you compete is in order to be able to set the standards. There was a big competition, you know, for uh, mobile uh, communication and other types of communication, how to set the standards at that time. And, and similarly, there's some um, standard setting now in artificial intelligence and China is putting a lot of resources there. So there are a lot of similarities. It's striking how similar it is. And Germany and the US in the 19th century escaped the middle income trap. And of course it could be that China is escaping it too, but it requires certain uh, strategies and um, Perhaps the two strong hands is one of the strategies. So when I think about the two strong hands, and Chang will say more about it, I comes to me to the battle of ideas. You know, what economic model does a country pursue? And the different ways to do it. And one way, it seems very close to me to have this German order liberalism perspective, where you promote competition to limit concentration of power. So you really want to have no concentration of power, so you limit the uh, concentration of power and one way to do it to have more competition 
And you can do this on the private sector and on the public sector. And this Freiburger School or the order liberalism, they actually would like to have competition at the, the private sector where, you know, instead of having national champions, so in France, they promote national champions. It's a different economic model. In Germany, they want to have this middle stand, which is, you know, you have a lot of mid-sized economies, mid-sized uh, mid companies, and you promote the mid-sized companies and promote competition among the mid-sized companies rather than have a few national champions being globally, you know, big companies. And that was essentially very much what the German model was. And this German orderism became very prominent in Germany after the Second World War, also because the Allies really didn't like any concentration of power in Berlin. They wanted to have a concentration, avoid any concentration of power. So you have a lot of competition at the private sector, so no concentration of economic power, but also have a federal system not to have a concentration in one capital, but you have a decentralized governance structure. So there's no concentration of power, uh, unlike what the Nazis had uh, before. It seems to me, to some extent, and I think Chang today will enlighten us, that for the private sector, uh, the, the Chinese going the same route, that they would like to have more mid-sized companies com fiercely competing with each other rather than a few national champions. But on the public sector, it's very different. So the German structure was after the Second World War, very federal structure, no concentration of political power. So uh, while in China, you had a tournament of local leaders and you select the best local leaders out of that. And I don't know how this uh, will play out, but there's of course a very strong power at the center, uh, much more powerful than in Germany. And uh, that's you know a different way of going it. So I would be curious to learn uh, how one would put these two strong hands in the context how you know we think in Germany versus France, where there's a struggle within Europe, what economic model uh, to follow. So Chang Tai put forward three questions, and uh, I'm curious uh, where, how we will think about them after Chang Tai gave us his perspective. The first question was, China's crackdown on the tech sector and the financial conglomerates will harm the economy, yes or no? And actually, 83% thought it will harm the economy, and 17% no. So that's a strong, so the going after and financial, Tencent and all this will actually harm the economy. The second question was, does Xi Jinping, the president of China, want, does he want to return to Mao's economic vision? Is it yes or no? And actually only one quarter thought he wants to go back to Mao's economic vision, which you know, might not be so successful, but 75 think that we will go in a different direction. Uh, that's uh, for the second question. The third question is China's economy will collapse in the medium term on the medium run. And only 10% think China's economy will collapse. 90% think they will do fine. And you know the high debt levels and all those things will not be worrying, uh, is not so worrisome because uh, it won't collapse. So with this, we pass on the, the microphone to Chiang Tai and he will tell us about his two strong hands. It's a very intriguing title and I think it's a very nice hypothesis to get uh, deeper insights how the Chinese economy will look like or is moving to a new framework. Thanks again, Chiang Tai. We're looking forward to your presentation. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, can everybody hear me? Yes. Perfect. Okay, great. So I think that there's one message or one idea or one question that I, I want you to be thinking about. It's the question is, what is the political foundation for China's support of the private sector? So that's going to be my overarching question. And that, that's going to be what, what I'm going to try to answer. The way I'm going to start this is that I'm going to start by just revisiting the headlines coming out of China that we've seen in the last two or three years. And the headlines have been dominated by, by the stories of, 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 of the crackdowns on some of the most successful Chinese companies. That, 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 and, it's, and it's useful to group it into two groups of, of companies. There's been a crackdown on some of the most innovative Chinese companies on the tech sector. And here I'm just listing some of them, but it's not, these are not the only ones. So there's been a crackdown on, on, on Alibaba. There's been a crackdown on Tencent. There's been a crackdown on, on Meituan. There's been a crackdown on Didi. 
you know, not so long ago, I think I was having a, a, a conversation with Marcus just a few years ago about whether some of the money platforms of Tencent or Ali are going to dominate the world. Nobody is talking about that now, right? <laughs> uh, talking about, so, so just think about sort of the sea change that we've seen in, um, in the last two years. The other thing I, uh, the, uh, I, I want you to know that this has also come out in, in the media, but perhaps it, it's been less prominent, but it's also been as important. This started earlier, starting in about 2018, there's been a systematic dismantling of the largest Chinese conglomerates. So these are a combination of financial companies, real estate companies, or just mixed conglomerates that do a variety of things. So here I'm just listing some of them. The Wanda Group was perhaps one of the first one, the Anban Group, the Hainan Group that does everything from airlines to banking to real estate. You know, it's a, yeah, I guess it, it's a conglomerate. The, the Tomorrow Group and, and, and last fall, everybody was, was uh, focused on, on the Hanga or in, in English, uh, Evergrande, right? So that's been the, the other, but I, I just want you to realize that this is not all that's going on, that, that I think that the message that what you see out, I think is absolutely right, that there's been a crackdown on some of the largest, on some of the largest, some of the, uh, some of the most successful Chinese companies, which, you know, I think that if you were to ask, if we were to be doing this seminar three or four years ago or five years ago, nobody would have ever expected that. Everybody thought that some of these companies were going to be the Chinese, were the Chinese champions, or they were eventually going to be the uh, Chinese champions. So what's going on? And I, I would say that there's one, there's a conventional wisdom that is emerging, that I see emerging, and I'll just pick on two headlines to illustrate what I think is the conventional wisdom. Uh, Wall Street Journal, set, uh, set, uh, September 2021, the headline is, it uh, says, Xi Jinping aims to rein in Chinese capitalism hue to Mao's socialist vision, that, that basically China is going back to Mao's economic model of socialism, uh, central planning, uh, reliance on state-owned firms. Uh, just in the most recent issue of The Economist, the headline was, is China uninvestable? Right. So I would say that this is one sort of dominant story that's come out of China. What I also want to highlight is that there's also another campaign that's been going on for five, six, seven years that hasn't really made it into the headlines. But for anybody that pays attention to what goes on on the ground in China, it's equally big, equally strong. And and um, maybe even have have have, have uh, important effects. So I would. So here's what I just want, want to summarize: that at the same time that you have seen this crackdown on on the largest and the most successful Chinese private firms, what you also see is that there's been a rollout of a number of of institutional changes that have improved conditions for private firms, right? So I just wanna, and, and there's a lot that, uh, there's a lot here, I, and I will say that this has been done maybe in a, in a more quiet way, and none of this has made it into the Western media. But I think it's, it's equally as important, and what, what I see quantitatively in the data is that they're equally as important. There's a lot of it, so let me just try to summarize what I think are the most important parts of this. Number one is that business regulations have been dramatically simplified. That is, in every locality in China, it is now really, really easy to register your business. That's either done online or there's or every single town, every single village, every single city, there's, there's a one-stop shop where you can register your business. And the other thing that has happened is that the amount of capital that you need in order to register your business has uh, 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 has come down. So starting a business has become very, very easy in China. And later on, I'll show you some data that I think that this has had a very big effect in the number of startups in China. 
The second piece of the changes that I've seen is that I think that there's been a vast improvement or changes in what I'm gonna call judicial legal institutions that are focused on business. Okay, I, I don't want to just leave the impression that there's been an overall improvement in judicial in uh, ju in in the legal in the legal institutions. There hasn't, but particularly, but the ones that are focused on business, I don't think there's any question that these have changed, and I think for for the better. I, and I and I, and here, let me just highlight three things. There's a new bankruptcy law, and there, there's a there's a new bankruptcy law, and there are new bankruptcy courts. Um, so this was a process. Bankruptcy used to be done by the local, by used to be done by local cadres, and it's now out of the hands of the local cadres. And there's there there's now a legal system, and there's now a there there there, there there's now a judicial system that deals with the bankruptcy. There's been a vast improvement in payment enforcement, uh, and I think that you know a, a big part of it has been the the creation and the spread of the social credit system so that it's now really easy or very hard to escape not making your payment. So payment enforcement uh, uh, has uh, improved dramatically. There are also now new courts outside of bankruptcy, new legal, uh, there's a now a new legal system whose only purpose is to adjudicate business disputes, contract disputes, and, 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 and things like that. Empirically, what you see in the data is that the the time that it takes to adjudicate a business dispute drops dramatically, right? And if you sort of talk with people to, to try to understand what's going on on the ground, what you also find out very quickly is that is that there's the creation of, of this new legal system, and there are also high powered incentives that have been put in place on the on on the people that are in charge of the system to be as efficient as possible. So maybe the way to think about it is that there's like a mini Maoist campaign to make business dispute resolution better or, e e or easier. What you also see is that all of these decisions are published online. So you can go and, and there are millions of them. So then so that it's really easy to get this information. Third- but George, I can ask a quick- Is absolutely. it China-wide the whole or is it from providence to providence different? So is, is there also a control that there's more control moving to Beijing away from the local authorities? This is all done at the local level. I mean, this okay. is all, yeah. All but the bankruptcy that, law applies to all of China, I guess. Yes, the bankruptcy law uh, applies at, at, at the local, uh, yes, no, that's that's right. But, but if you know anything about China, that basically it's still, in terms of the administrative authority, it, it's, still a, it's still a hugely Very decentralized local. system. Yes, and okay. then it's and it's up to the local government to implement this. Right? Uh, uh, okay. um, the third thing that I, I want to highlight is that I think that there's also been a big improvement of of uh, of financial institutions. That empirically, what you see in the data is that the, the share of credit from the state-owned banks to small and medium-sized firms goes up. Empirically, what you see in the data is that there's there's an explosion in VC funds and there's an explosion in startups that are funded by by uh, by by uh, by, by uh, VC funds. There's a vibrant uh, uh, Chinese version or several Chinese versions of uh, Silicon Valley in the Shenzhen, and also there's there's a district in uh, Beijing called Zhongguansun, which which uh, there's not been a whole lot of discussion uh, here, but I think it's also a vibrant uh, startup uh, e ecosystem there as uh, as well. And the last thing I want to mention is that there are now two new stock exchanges. There's now there, there's a new Beijing stock exchange. And there was a earlier there was a Shanghai stock exchange called Star, which was dedicated only to to a science and technology startup. So what, what, what this does is that you, you can see how this helps Helps us helps the, the the VCs and the VC funded startups because it provides an exit option uh, uh, for, for for that. And the one last fact, if if you want to summarize all this, that if you look at how China did in the World Bank doing business indicators, this thing that was canned last year, which I think is rather 
unfortunate. There are all kinds of problems with, with things like the World Bank doing, being, doing business indicators. But I do think there's a lot of useful information that I think, you know, the way I think about the doing business indicators, it's like the US News and World Report uh, ranking of the best universities in the US. There are all sorts of problems. But I'd rather it be there than not being there because there's useful there is there is useful information. But yeah, so but what you see in terms of the World Bank doing business indicators before it was canned last year is that China over the last 10 years has improved dramatically. Uh, in and what you also see is that the Chinese authorities have replicated something like the World Bank doing business indicators across China to to basically collect data on on how each locality was doing in terms of, 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 of uh, making business easier, make, I mean, making the business better, okay? So this is what is going, I think this is the reality in, 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 uh, in China now. So- Can I just yes, say about this uh, credit to SMEs, the small yeah. and medium enterprises? Is this primarily coming from End Financial and the new platforms? Which no, is it coming on from state owned? Citing, no, the banks. data that I'm citing is basically a credit that is coming from the state owned banks. Now, if you mm -hmm. add on the stuff that the, uh, coming from Ant from Ant Financial and all these other financial, it's mm -hmm. not just Ant Financial, but all these local financing vehicles. Yeah. What you see is that the share of money that uh, of credit that's going to to the small and medium sized private firms has really exploded dramatically. Uh, so the, the data that I cited is only from the state-owned banks. What I'm saying is that you even see it among the, the uh, state-owned banks. So the way that I, I would say that, you know, so we are trying to... Can I just, is there a public policy statement saying that's our second hand or is there any official announcement or it just, you see it on the ground? But there's no Xi Jinping never announced that second. There's hand. never any announcement. The the second hand or the, even the first hand. That's my terminology. <laughs> that, uh, uh, that's something that I uh, I that I can no no no. So the 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 names that I'm giving is not Communist Party name. Uh, okay. It's my name for for it. I, I try to mimic the Communist Party. That if if they were to have. A marketing department or a well-functioning marketing department, not the propaganda department, but they'll have a well-functioning market department. This is what I would say they should do uh, in terms of marketing, right? So this is the Chinese version of the Marcus Academy, right? If you want to put uh, 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 put it that that way. So you may think that. So that, let me just point out that what 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 seems to be a contradiction in China's policy direction. That on the one hand, it is a very dangerous time to be somebody like Jack Ma. Like it's 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 uh, and, and 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 this is well understood. And in the data, what you see, and this is the part that is widely uh, uh, discussed in the media, that the market cap of the largest publicly trade uh, or the large largest publicly traded firm in China has fallen like has fallen like a rock. Uh, uh, that if you put your money into publicly traded Chinese firms, God bless you, because uh, uh, you would have lost a ton of money. Uh, but at the same time, the, the conditions for the private, small and medium sized firms, I think most, obviously most of which are still not traded, uh, are, are still not traded, um, have never been better. If you look at the data on say the number, the, the, the number of firms, you see a tripling in the number of firms over the last 10 years. Uh, uh, you see, I mentioned before, a vibrant startup and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the vibrant uh, VC industry. Uh, so the, the big question is, what is going on? Why is it dangerous to be Jack Ma? And why is it that at the same time that they're that they're putting down the hammer on the most successful Chinese companies, they're trying to help the other firms that could eventually turn out to be like Jack Ma? I'm going to take my time to answer that question because, and I'm going to take a step back, and I'm going to bring you back to China from ten years ago, and I want to illustrate. Um, we, why is it that it is currently a very dangerous time to be Jack Ma? Because I think to understand that question, you have to understand where Chinese growth comes from. 
Okay, so forgive me for my detour. I'm going to give a five minute, a minute detour. Then I'm going to come back and, 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 and answer the question. Okay? okay, so let me start by bringing you back to China for about 10 years ago. So about 10 years ago, maybe this was nine years ago, nine or eight years ago, my collaborators on, on this other project, we made a visit to a small Chinese city in southern China, small, about two million people. We went there because we wanted to understand uh, uh, what local governments did. Right? So we got there and our entree into the system was through the, this person that was a vice mayor of education in this city. Uh, because he was a former student of one of, of one of the people that I, I, I was doing this project with. So my collaborators showed up at the vice mayor's office. So, so just to be clear who this person was, this was a person in charge of the public schools in the city. We got there and the vice mayor was not there. And this person's chief of staff uh, apologized and said that, you know, he was looking forward to your visit, my, uh, his most honorable uh, uh, teacher. Uh, and he's going to try really hard to 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 uh, to meet with them later in the day. But some important visitors had come had uh, had come to town. So then um, he's they started to chat about what the vice mayor's office does. And the vice mayor's chief of staff proudly, you know, after about half an hour, handed us this flow chart. Okay, they say this is what we do. Okay. And here I'm going to give you my translation of what this flowchart says. So the vice mayor for education, this is the most important thing that they do. They, they there's this process. They actively look for quality prospects. They have an initial discussion to learn about the investor. They undertake a feasibility analysis that I did my land and other needed services. Then whatever it is that they're talking about goes to, to the approval by the vice mayor, and they sign the uh, uh, they sign the uh, agreement. So let, let, let me take a pause here and let me ask if there's a way in which I can ask the audience, what do you think the vice mayor's chief of staff is talking about? Yeah, I, probably it's about new projects to sell a certain land where new companies can build. It's not about land. What, let me say what this is. This is exactly what it looks like that what the vice mayor's office was doing was basically what are qual what are quality prospects these are basically businesses that that are that are setting up in the city so what you quickly find out and i guess we went there uh, uh, my, my my collaborators went there because they they knew what was going on that what you see in the city and this is something that you see in every city in china is that what at every level of the bureaucracy, the main thing that the bureaucracy was doing is that they weren't doing what the official title or the official mm -hmm. office was doing. What they were doing is that they were basically working overtime to basically get companies to set up in the city. That's what quality prospects are. It's basically all these companies, you know, who can I? Uh, so think of what they were doing as being sort of the equivalent of what happened of, of uh, you know, what happened three years ago when uh, 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 in, in American cities, when Amazon said that they were gonna set up a second headquarter, right? All the cities went into overdrive and saying, hey, hey me, 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 it's uh, my turn. That's what these guys are doing, right? That's what the, these, the, these guys, so let me just give you a broader sense of, of, of how this local government is organized. The number one guy is the secretary of the Communist Party. The number two guy is the mayor. So this is, I think that's well understood. So if you ever do anything in China, don't ever make the mistake to think that the mayor is the number one guy. He's not, he's not. It's the party secretary that's the number one guy. And then there are nine vice mayors and the guy that we knew is one of the nine vice mayors. But what you find, and, and, then, and then what we can document in this case is that each of the vice mayor is assigned roughly 20 important projects. And what, what we mean by projects are, are basically, they are in charge, they are the point person for specific private companies. And they are responsible for bringing them into the city. They're responsible for making sure that these companies have everything that they need 
in order to grow, uh, to, to grow, and it, we were we were not able to figure out the companies that the mayor was in charge of or the party secretary was in charge of, but undoubtedly there are some that, that are in their hands. So the way that you want to think about- these companies are these startups or these are large companies just searching for a new headquarter like Amazon? These are, in this case, it's mostly large companies. The, the, uh, the, the, uh, yeah, the, the, these are, and just to be clear for, you know, for those of you who, for those of you who are enamored with the notion of state-owned firms, these are all private firms. I mean, mm -hmm. these are all private firms. So, so really like what these guys care the most about is not the local state-owned firms, but it's, but it's these private firms. Uh, 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 that that's what they are uh, 10 years ago. That's what they are spending their time on. Uh, and that that was their most important political priority to try to bring these companies into town and to get these companies to grow. So the way I want to summarize sort of what the system was is that these local officials, these local cadres, they use the power of the local communist party to help their projects. Okay. In this case, think about 250 companies. In this city of two, in the city of two, uh, 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 two uh, million, and then the other piece, which I think is important, is that it's not just this this local government that is doing that. That, that all these local governments are competing with with are 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 competing with each other in or in order to do this. So the best way that I can think of to to describe how competition takes place is that it's. It's really about the competition between businesses in the different cities. Uh, it's the competition between Shanghai Inc., all the companies that are tied to the party secretary of Beijing versus Beijing Inc., versus Shenzhen Inc., versus the 2,000 other localities in China. Okay. So, in terms of, is it like opening the doors to make regulation easy, or is it also providing funding? So they're connected with state-owned banks? That's and the help also fund these these companies. Yeah, that's a great question. Until about two thousand and, and ten or so, local governments did not have access to capital, so it was not about access to capital. Mm -hmm. One of the consequences of of the two thousand eight financial crisis was that China implemented a mm -hmm. big fiscal stimulus, and that opened the doors because the way that was implemented was that they basically got these local governments to create these off balance sheet financial companies. And then when the fiscal when, when that fiscal program when the fiscal stimulus was over, they basically used these financial vehicles, these off balance sheet companies, to then channel money, uh, and and that then became the origin of uh, shadow banking in in China. A couple of years later, that's when uh, shadow banking started as an effort to try to get access to funds directly from 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 the Chinese families. Uh, but that was the so think of this as being sort of where things were about 10 years ago. Why does this lead us up to the moment that we are in? It's about the political implications of this model, of, of this, this particular uh, 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 model of growth. And then maybe the way that I want to illustrate this is to talk about a story that came out in the New York Times in 2012 that did two things. It won the New York Times the Pulitzer Prize and it also got the New York Times permanently blocked in China, okay? But, and I think it's important because it's, because I think this illustrates, the, the, the story in, in the Times illustrates the political, um, the, the, the political consequences of, of that particular model, which is, which is gonna lead us to the first strong hand that I, I'm gonna get back to in a minute. So the story in the Times came out, it came out in October of 2012, was a story about this big uh, insurance company. It wasn't just an insurance company called Ping An Insurance. Think of it, this as a company This was traded in Hong Kong and Shanghai with a market cap of about $200 billion. If you look at who owns the company, it's the HSBC Bank and three local financing vehicles. Uh, so local governments uh, that, that, that have put their money. What the New York Times noticed, so the, the title, the, the, the article of the New York Times was called The, 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 the Hidden Shareholders of, a, of a Pipingan. And what the guy from the Times figured out, it's a good question how he, how that a couple of years before 2012, 3% of the company shifted to becoming owned by this, by 
by this other company called Taihong Holdings. Okay, which what is Taihong Holding? It's basically a holding shell, right? So what the article is about is basically what is Taihong Holdings? Okay, so this is a picture from that piece in the Times. Okay, what is Taihong uh, Holdings? When and what the Times was able to do is that at the time there's this Chinese registration data. It's basically the the registration records of companies, and it was possible at that time to basically go to these to these local registration offices. You follow a, a a very basic form. You pay a small fee, and you can see the registration documents of every Chinese company. So that's what the Times did, and. What and this is what he found that he he found that Taihong Holdings is owned by two people and by three other holding shells, okay. And then he went back and he looked, got the registration documents of each one of these holding shells, and the first thing that he documented is that these holding shells are look like they look like a Russian doll. That is, mm -hmm. you know, it's a holding shell. When you look at the holding shell, it itself is owned by several other holding shells, and then that holding shelf is owned by a bunch of other whole, uh, a bunch of other holding shells, and so on. What the reporter from the Times, he had the patience, is that he basically went and he traced down the entire tree. He traced down the entire tree, and, he, and eventually he figured out that Taihong Holdings was owned by basically people that were relatives of Wen Jiabao's family, which was who he was the, 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 the number two person in China at the time, okay? Mm -hmm. And by this other person called uh, the, 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 the woman at the bottom called Duan, called, called uh, Duan Wei Hong, uh, called, called Duan, Duan Wei Hong. And there's now a fascinating book written by her former husband uh, that came out in the last year called Red Roulette that I strongly recommend that you read because now I think with that book, we now know the full story of this case. Okay, so what do I want you to take away from this? What I want you to take from this is that this kind of corporate structure started to become the standard, the norm for all the large Chinese private companies. And, and then it's, when you start to ask why, it's easy to think about a reason why. Think back to the previous model where all these private companies, they needed these local communist party officials to basically smooth the path for them. Okay, now you can ask a question, okay, why are these local communist party officials doing this for them? Maybe they're doing this because they are the Chinese equivalent of, say, priests of the Catholic Church. They're doing this out of the goodness of their hearts and out of the sense of mission. Maybe that's part of what, what's going on. But then at, at a point where some of these companies, some of these projects turned out to be billion dollar companies, you know, there's a very real temptation to say, why not, you know, I worked so hard to get this company from $10 million to a billion. Why isn't it just fair that I have a small piece of that? Okay, so this started to become this practice started to become widespread okay, to, to, to widespread. So this brings us back then to the first strong hand. Okay, so this was the world as of 2012, 2013, 2014. What my interpretation- Would you call these people almost oligarchs, the Chinese way of having oligarchs? This is, I would say that's right. I would say, I, I, I think what prevents it from being oligarch is, is just yes and no. Yes, but what, but there's also this other feature of the Chinese system, which is tremendous competition, which basically mm -hmm. limits the, uh, yeah. so it's different from the, I think the Russian model, which what, 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 what typically thinks about when you think about oligarchs is that very little of this, I think, is about rent. Most of it is really the, the, that these are real businesses. Mm -hmm. uh, the, these are real businesses and they're, they are competitive. Uh, they are because it's a very competitive system. Uh, um, but the political, so I want to bring you back, the political implication of this particular model is that it's this, is, is that this system was based on this on this alliance 
between entrepreneurs and local party cadres. Okay, so what what started to happen in my interpretation is that as these companies grew and became billion dollar companies, you know, billion dollars means that you start to matter, right? And uh, you start to matter and the influence of the wealthy people, such as Ms. Duan, who was in the picture, became so widespread that it was viewed as an existential threat to the party in, in the following sense, that basically, if you are a local party cadre, what do you care more about? Do you care more about your $100 million worth of equity uh, 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 in these companies? Or do you care about maintaining your loyalty to the party? And what is fabulous about the book by Ms. Duang's husband, and I strongly, uh, strongly recommend it, is that there's one chapter in the book where- can you, can you repeat the title? Because somebody would like to know the- Yes, I love Red Kyan. Roulette. Red Roulette is, Red roulette. is the okay. title. There's a fascinating chapter in the book where they describe how they were able to basically push for the promotion of their of, of, of their people in the party. Uh, uh, so think about what, what happens then. The question is who controls who, right? Is, is, is it the party that's in charge of sort of the most important parts of the party on in terms of who, who gets promoted up the system? Or is it just the private interest of people like Ms. Duan and her husband? And I would say that you, what you see is growing evidence that 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 the uh, that that it's is these entrepreneurs start to become really powerful politically. Uh, they start to become very powerful, or at least there was the perception that these guys really mattered uh, politically. So, so I'm to, can I? So yes. there's this understanding that how the Chinese system works is through this tournament within the party. You know, you're very successful in your providence. Once you're more successful than the others, you move up the ranks and become yeah. the more successful in Beijing. You, this would be undermined. Do, do you subscribe to this tournament view? Or do you think this is now destroying the tournament view, essentially? I, would, I, mean, I mean, the tournament view is, I would say, the official narrative in China. Uh, that's the uh, official narrative. It's... Um, Obviously, it's really hard to know whether this is what is going on or not. I mean, mm -hmm. so the, 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 uh, the, this is not a joke, but it's a, like the day when I get access to the personnel files of the Communist Party's organization department, I can test it empirically. <laughs> but uh, that's not going. Uh, that's not going to happen. So I can safely say it. I, I'm going to put forward that I think that. They are, I am sure there are cases in which it's this tournament, but I would say that that is, a, I think, a dramatic oversimplification of, 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 of how, who, of who gets promoted and who does not get uh, promoted. And I want to say that there's, there, 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 there are lots of other potential forces that also drive, that, that, that also uh, drive it. So let me just come back and I say, what we have seen in China in the last 10 years is this broad-based campaign, okay, of which what I'm describing is only one part of it, to restore the control of the party. And I would say that the, the way that you wanted to think about it is that, you know, I think there's this conventional wisdom that, that the senior leader parties, uh, uh, senior leaders in the party, they frequently talk about the, uh, the, the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe, and they say, that the main mistake that was made, and this is a literal quote, is that they were not man enough to stand up uh, and take and 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 take and 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 take and take back control. So their prescription of what happened of, of what happened in Eastern Europe is that the Communist Party lost uh, uh, lost their monopoly on power, and they were not willing to fight in order to keep the monopoly in power. So, what ha what, what's happened in China in the last ten years was basically like uh, the the, uh, the sort of a big campaign by the party to not go that route, right? Uh, to to not go that route. So, I'm going to call this this is not party. The, this is not what the party has called it, but I'm going to call it the first strong hand. That is, it's basically uh, uh, what has happened is that there's been a crackdown on forces 
that pose any kind of a threat to to the control of the party, which includes the large wealthy private firms. And, and, and hopefully it's now clear, at least my view on why is it that these guys pose, pose was viewed as posing such a threat to the party. So it's not just a standard story in the US that the wealthy companies have money and they have power, but I think it's in China, it's a little bit different just because of this, of the particular alliance uh, between the local communist party cadres and and the successful entrepreneur but i also want 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 the audience to realize that it's not just this right that it's part of this broader camp it's part of the broader campaign to restore the control of the party that's the way you want to think about the anti-corruption campaign that all almost all the anti-corruption cases is is about these local cadres getting payouts from 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 uh, from uh, wealthy uh, from uh, wealthy uh, entrepreneurs, there's been a crackdown on celebrities. If you think about why are celebrities dangerous, well, because they're celebrities. <laughs> they're uh, that that they're a source of independent political power. There's been a crackdown on NGOs. There's a crackdown on all the other potential sources of the transmission of uh, ideology. At least that's my interpretation of the crackdown on on the after school tutoring companies because there's now you know these these Tutoring companies are not in the business of transmitting Communist Party ideology. They're there to make sure your kid passes the math test, and and that is no good uh, because you don't control what is being taught uh, in in mm -hmm. the. And then let me just go on and say there are the party cells in. Uh, there's now you know, widespread uh, cells of the Communist Party in private companies, golden shares in critical infrastructure companies at the level of the party. Uh, party committees are now much more important in, in, in state entities, by which I mean state-owned firms, hospitals, universities. So anything, it, it used to be that there, there, I mean, there always has been this dual structure in, in the state-owned in the, in the state uh, state entities. For example, for most of the people here in this audience, you, you may have visited Chinese universities that there's the president of the university or the dean of, of a school that 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 you may see, but what you also know is that almost always right across the corridor, there's also the office of the party secretary of the, the secretary of the Communist Party, and the authority of 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 the latter has increased relative to the authority of the of the former. There's now the increased importance of showing, making sure that you're loyal to the party in terms of in, in terms of whether you are promoted empirically, what you see is that the, the, the same guys that my co-authors visited, they used to work 24 seven on business development. That's no longer true, right? They now spend a great deal of their time on political study set, on, on political, study set, uh, political study sessions, learning Xi Jinping thought, et cetera. And also every few months, there's now a different party inspection team that comes through, that comes through, checks on things, and checks on things, and it's a way to try. I'm going to say it's all part of this camp, part of this campaign to impose party discipline. Okay, so is there a way to quantify how big the efficiency losses are in terms of economic progress? It's a great question, think? right? Um, um, I wish, yeah, I mean, I would love to do that, or I would love if if somebody were to able to do even something simple, like mm -hmm. just a time use survey on what local cutters are doing, are spending time on, are, are, are doing time on, that would be lovely. But part of what the, the I think it would be very hard to do it in, mm -hmm. in uh, two days China, because it would be, it would be viewed as, as something that also threatens the control of the party, if, if you, if you were to try to, to do that. So, so, so this is the first strong hand. And, and, and the way I want you to understand is that it's not in isolation, right? It's not just this one thing, but it's just pro, part, it, it's just, I think, probably the most important component of this broader, of this, of this broader campaign to try to, you know, I guess to use Marcus's term to try to make sure that Chinese oligarchs do not control the political system, okay? Now, let me just say that, what, what, just make clear uh, sort of this my view on what this is not, okay? 
it is not a crackdown on large companies per se, right? That is, it's not about the Chinese all of a sudden becoming like Elizabeth Warren. Uh, that, that, I, I don't think that that's what it is. Because there's no crackdown if, 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 you know, there's a lot of people who are saying that, oh, it's about crackdown um, monopolies, trying to deal with mar trying to deal with the market power of some of these platform companies. There is zero crackdown on some of the biggest monopolies, but they just happen to be state owned. Right. And let me just also highlight for the for for the foreign investors is that there is zero crackdown on the large foreign firms. And in fact, the conditions from the foreign firms, I think, have gotten even better. Uh, so uh, Tesla in Shanghai has gotten deals that I think no other company in China has been able to get access to. Taiwan Semiconductor in a non in Nanjing uh, is treated well, it's treated well. And if they ever wanted to expand in China, you will, I guarantee you that a thousand local governments will be, will, will be knocking on their door. Foxconn, the another- deal is, is then organized by the local government or in Beijing that give Tesla a special deal? Who is deciding about this special? It's Shanghai. I mean, it, it's- it's it's, Shanghai. It, okay. it's It's a Shanghai, it's a, uh, I mean, the, let me just say that like the biggest deal that, that I mean, you look at the kind of deals that, that Tesla has, it's, it's incredible. The, like, they get some of the best land in Shanghai for free. Uh, they are the only foreign car company that's, uh, that has been allowed to own the company 100%. All the other companies have to operate through joint ventures. Uh, and the reason is because it is viewed in the, it's viewed in the same way by the Chinese as as uh, as uh, U.S. investors. Like if you think about why Tesla is valuation is so high, it's because it's it's viewed as being the company that is going to bring us to the next stage of cars. That we are finally going to going to move away from the hundred year from the model that was introduced by Henry Ford, and there's going to be the new paradigm, and Tesla is going to be in in charge of it. So. They are willing to do whatever it takes to, to get their piece of, of, of this. So for and, and, and the, if the way I think about it is that, look, the reason why there's no crack on a large for, on, on large for foreign firms is or it's easy to understand why there's no crackdown on the state owned monopolies. That is, you control them. So they never pose a threat to you. Why is there not a crack on a large for foreign firms? Well, precisely because they're foreign. That is. Because they're foreign firms, they can, they, they can never challenge you politically in the same way that, that Jack Ma can, okay? Uh, so it sort of reminds me of the story, I, I don't know whether it's true, but there's a story that I've heard about Indonesia under Suharto that the only people that could make the deals with Suharto's families were the Indonesian Chinese. That if you're a native Indonesian, you weren't able to make a deal. And the reason was because the Chinese were in the minority and they were also hated. They were also hated. So then even if they become billionaires, because they were Chinese, they could never threaten Suharto, they can never uh, threaten Suharto, uh, uh, so, uh, Suharto political. So I, again, I, I want to emphasize here that it's, it's I, my view is that it's not about sort of, it's, it's a very different, Although on the surface, it may look like the same kind of thing that we're seeing in the US, you know, the stories that we're hearing out of the FTC, the things, stories we're hearing out of Elizabeth Warren staff about, you know, growing monopoly power, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't think this is at all what is going on in China, despite on the, on the surface, it looks like the same thing. Here, I think it fundamentally is about the threat to to uh, uh, to a threat to the Leninist party. Uh, now, let me end by saying that, you know, the obvious problem with this political campaign with the first strong hand, and this is what Marcus, high, the, this is what, what uh, uh, Marcus highlighted, that if you crack down on some of your most successful firms and more broadly, if you, if, if, if you crack down on the model on this, alliance that has delivered you growth, then obviously, you know, you're going to hurt growth. Uh, that if, 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 
So, and then if you hurt growth, then the, if you hurt growth, then, then I mean, the, the, then that is the other thing that eventually, I think if, mm -hmm. if the, the Chinese economy falters in the long run, that I think is also gonna pose a very real threat to the party, to, to the power of the party, because it's built a lot of its legitimacy on this notion that it is competent and, and, and it is delivered growth on prosperity to Chinese citizens. And if it doesn't do that anymore, then that, then, then that is serious political trouble. So this is where the second strong hand comes in, right? The, the second strong hand, and, and, I, I, and, I, and then I, 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 I'm, I'm not going to, to repeat the list of things that I've done, but let me just say, what is the vision? The, the vision is that it's basically the recognition that the first strong hand, which they need in order to survive politically, basically to kill off the oligarchs also hurts growth. But then if you really hurt growth, that is also going to kill you. So you, and then the second strong hand is to try to square that circle. That is, it's what we're gonna, what, what, what I think what they're attempting to do is to support the, the, the millions of small and medium sized firms to do what they haven't done for decades, but now they're beginning to, they, they, are, they are beginning to, to, uh, to do this. And the key advantage of, of the small and medium sized firms is that as long as they remain small, they don't pose a political threat. They're not oligarchs. So it's about you don't, pull, you don't face a threat from a $30 million company, but you do face a threat from a $30 billion company. But if somebody so, owns uh, 20 of these firms, is this a problem? Um, it is possible. It, it's possible that there's somebody that owns 20 of them. And uh, if you have me back, Marcus, I have another paper where I try to document this. I, I try to document, but let, let, let me not go in, uh, in uh, let me not go into that now. But let me just end by just saying, by summarizing what I think the vision is, that it's about trying to do, to have two things. It's about having a dynamic market economy, okay? that is fully under the control of the Communist Party. That's the goal, okay? Mm -hmm. And whether they're gonna be able to do it or whether these two, uh, or another way to say this is that whether these two strong hands are in contradiction, I guess I don't know. I, 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 I don't know. So, uh, you know, can you have growth if you, if, if from, from a lot more million dollar companies, but at the same time, you kill off the, the, you kill off the billion dollar companies. Will the millions of dollar companies stop investing if they know that if they ever become a billion dollar company, uh, they, they will come into the firing line of the party, right? I don't know, uh, I, I don't know. And that's the, but here I, I, I yeah. So I, I guess that's all, that's all I wanna say that is, this is where I think China is now, and whether it'll work or not, um, time will tell. Let me ask a few questions also from the audience. Uh, so you have more slides, or we can? Yeah, let, let me questions. Let me kill my slides. Yeah. Uh, so one thing is, if I'm a small and medium enterprise, but I'm very successful and become bigger and bigger. Yeah. What do I do when I become too big? I, I spin off companies in order to stay small, or do I just stop growing and say, oh, I don't, I want to fly under the radar? And the two ways to say, oh, I just don't become active anymore. I just uh, keep doing what I'm doing, but I don't expand. Or is it, I spin off companies? And do we see already certain companies spinning off other sub companies just to stay small? So this would be one conclusion somebody might have. No? You specialize more, and rather than having thing, a conglomerate that's covering many, many things, I spin off companies and they're all small and independent. Then. That's a good question. I guess I don't have the evidence yet to fully, I, 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 yeah, I would say that I don't have the evidence to fully answer that question. Um, I mean, one answer could could be that you just you that if you know this is going to happen, then you just 
don't undertake the efforts and you don't undertake the investments that are needed in order to grow. Uh, 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 in order to start a new company. The question then is what is view? You could start off a new company and I guess I do have documentation that an important margin by which entrepreneurs grow in China is is through is through the is through the extensive margin, uh, uh, and not and not so much through the. Um, the question is whether having lots of companies will also put you in the firing line. Uh, 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 then uh, um, let me just say that, and and I think there's. Because you said everybody was managing 20 companies. It could be that I manage now 100 companies, 100 small companies, and I'm my incentives are equally distorted not to be loyal to the party, to, but be loyal. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. No, it used to, let, let me just go back to sort of uh, the story from the Times. It, it, so the way that the guy from the Times did it is that he basically went through the, he went through the paper documents. What is now possible is that all, the, all these registration data, it's been digitized. Mm -hmm. And there are now a couple of companies that now sell it, that now sell access. So now it is really easy to sort of to to put together this ownership map mm -hmm. of, of a given person. So it's really before it used to be hard. You, you basically have to go through every single uh, registry. If a person owns 200 companies, it's a lot of work to uh, figure it out. Now, I think it's 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 much easier to figure out whether a person has two, uh, two uh, has two hundred companies and then if you have 200 companies that are collectively worth 30 billion dollars i would think that the party is going to think of them in the same way right because uh, um so the, the other i don't really know have, oh sorry is that this you know if you think about when people talk about what's the big advantage of china and everybody tells me it's a scale you know, it's like you have 1.x yeah. yeah. million people, a billion people. Well, if you go to another market, it's a small, tiny market. Here yeah. you have to scale. Yeah. Yeah. And that speaks essentially that there's a huge advantage for being big. And if the official doctrine is not to allow it to you to be big, you don't take advantage of the scale. So you can actually reduce the scope to become much more specialized and still scale up. Uh, is this what you see that, you know, Companies become more specialized, less conglomerates, but they still want to exploit this scale. Or, or that's, there will be a tension of the two strong hands. They're saying, oh, you know, the first strong hand will prevent the, the exploiting the scale dimension. We see lots of creation of small companies. I think that the creation of new companies is, is recent enough that I don't... So let me just say that there are two things that, that we've seen in the data in the last 15 years. So what I'm going to tell you now is based on the registration right uh, on the registration records that you see that the top the top owners grow and the way they grow is is by essentially by by uh, by building up more firms and the way it's typically done is that they build up more firms by through joint ventures with state-owned firms. So that's one pattern. Uh, now, whether that has come to a halt, that has come to a halt, I guess our data doesn't, it's, it's, I think this, this, what I'm talking about is too recent uh, for it to show up yet in, uh, in the data. Uh, the other thing that you see is that lots of the single owner or one owner, one firm, uh, that, that has, that has exploded. The question that you're asking, I think, is really more a question about 10 years down the line, what are these guys going to do, right? And, yes. and, we'll, and we'll see. Uh, so the other thing is, and you hinted to it a little bit, is that it might be that certain data is just reclassified. So once you know the government doesn't like big firms anymore, I'd rather have five small SMEs and what was initially treated as one big firm is now, you know, two or five SMEs. Uh, is there an issue that all the loan data and other things, you know, given that I get a favorable treatment if I label myself an SME, uh, that there's a relabeling going on and that distorts the data in a sense? Just to... I, I guess in the, data, in the data that I have, that, so I have, let me just... Uh, 
I have access to the registration data up until, 2009, uh, to, uh, until 2019. I don't see that yet in the data. Uh, so maybe it eventually is going to happen, but I haven't seen it yet. Uh, so the uh, next issue I would like to raise is um, there was always the understanding, and we talked about this earlier, that the Chinese firms expand, become national champions, and then also to make, take on an important role in the international markets in other countries. Uh, if you don't allow national champions, if you don't allow big companies, it's probably much harder to reach abroad. Is this less important for the Chinese party that you know you have some national champions, you know, being very active in in, in other Asian countries or in Africa? One is sacrificing that deliberately, or that's it's overlooked that that's a one of the costs. Or that's not so important. The fact that if you go back to the world in China in 2012 or 2013, there's this really interesting pattern that you see in the Chinese data that in almost every country in the world, what you see is that large firms export and smaller firms don't. That's a pattern you see almost everywhere. In China, in, in, at least in the manufacturing data, you see exactly the opposite pattern. What you see is that the smaller firms are the one that export and the big firms don't. Uh, my interpretation of that pattern is, is that it's one of the consequences, well, it's one of the negative consequences of that particular, of the model of growth that I described, mm -hmm. that if you are, say, a car company based in Shanghai, what you do is that because you are the local champion, you don't, uh, you have the power to not let anybody else into that market, okay? Uh, to that, uh, to, but these are the largest companies. These are like if you look at the largest car companies. These are the Shanghai-based car car companies. Now, the the car companies that export in China, these are the companies that are the local champions of a city like the one that I described. I visit a two million person city. These are the companies that would like to sell in Shanghai, but they don't. They don't because they're basically blocked by 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 the by the Shanghai companies. So so the way that they can do it. So what you see them doing is that the and this is almost their words. They say that when we sell in Central America, the reason that we sell in Central America is because we can compete on a level playing field in Central America. But in, in Shanghai or Beijing or other other cities, we don't. We're up against the local party boss. Uh, so, I would think to just flip your question on the head that having more small and medium sized companies because of this part, so that, 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 let me just say, large, the empirical pattern is that the larger Chinese companies generally by and large do not export or they export less. It's a small and medium sized firms that do, that do. Having more small and medium sized firms, that force by itself, my prediction is that that's going to lead to more not less okay with one caveat with, with with one caveat which is is the reaction of the west to this model that is uh if you know that this is what you're dealing with uh, what what you, you are that this you are that that you are trading with a market economy that is under the control of the communist party then does that, will that make you, and we did lots of discussion about this, will that make you try to be more cautious in terms of who you engage in trade with? That fundamentally, you know that even if these are small companies, that they are fundamentally still under the control of the party, right? So it's, 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 it's the Huawei debate writ large. Uh, but if I may summarize what you're saying, because of this local party control, you have essentially a segmented market at yeah, home absolutely. in China. Yeah. And you don't have this scale effect because it's so segmented. So it's a big disadvantage. So what you do is rather than try to sell abroad, you become an international small company exporting a lot. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, but China forgoes essentially through the segmentation, this, the big advantage of scale effects at home, which it still allows the Teslas, the foreign firms, they can exploit the scale, but the domestic ones cannot. Exactly. Is this exactly. too yes. uh, stark? Yes. Okay. Yes. 
I see. So that's so very interesting. But in, in a sense, it reminds me, you know, in Germany, we have this Mittelstand, this mid-sized companies, which are small, very specialized, but very internationally active. You know, they're, they're leaders in very small segments uh, around the globe, uh, but they don't, they don't grow to large conglomerates. They're just run by some families. Uh, and there's some similarity there, I guess, uh, on this. But the that new thing is the, the model, segmentation right? of I, the Chinese I, market. I would love to know why is it that Germany developed in this way? I, I mean, I, 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 I don't, I, I. Um, so historically, Germany was very segmented too. You know, it was it was not one country; it was many little uh, small states come together, and uh, there was a spirit always to have smaller companies, family-run companies. Uh, what's small in I probably it's what's small in China might be large in Germany because the number of people is uh, large, much larger. So let me just conclude uh, a little bit. So we also we did not touch on this overinvestment in real estate, the huge debt burden. Does this interact in this vision somehow? And this came also from you know how you may how China was actually managing in 2008, the global financial crisis by having this huge stimulus. You touched upon it a little bit, that this had some implications that suddenly the local leaders could also help in the financing of these new companies yeah. and give them extra leverage. And it made this more powerful and brought the first hand in. But you see the debt level interplaying with this and overinvestment in real estate. Is this totally orthogonal or do we have to, to see any connection? No. I mean, I think it's it's part of it. I mean, where does it come from? I mean, it 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 comes from the same. It comes from the same alliance. It it, it comes from exactly the same uh, alliance, um, but where it was, I'm going to say, the institutional consequence of how China decided to fund its fiscal stimulus. That is, if, the funny thing is that if you look at the if if you look at the 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 accounts of the Chinese government in 2008 2009 when they ran a huge fiscal stimulus you look at the budget deficit of of the government nothing changed <laughs> it's, 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 and the reason is because the way that they did it was basically to create all these off balance sheet companies and then they would borrow uh, they're not officially part of the government not officially part of the government the really interesting that then to just go back to your story is what happened after 2010, when the fiscal stimulus was over, the central government said, okay, guys, the, the, the fiscal stimulus program is over, Let, let's shut down all these uh, local, these, these off balance sheet companies. And you can imagine what these local uh, governments said that, you know, I have 10% of GDP flowing in, uh, flowing through these financial companies. No, thank you. I like uh, having con having control o over this. Then what happens is that then they started to fund these companies and they, start, they started to fund these projects, right? It, and it's, it's, it's this alliance. And starting in 2015, and, and then if you wanna go through the full story, in 2012 then what, what, what happened was that the, the, the central government basically ordered the state-owned banks to stop lending to these off-balance sheet companies the response of the local government then was was to say, okay, fine, we're then going to set up the shadow banking institutions to basically get money that we mm -hmm. we can no longer get from the we can no no longer get from the central banks. And then what they started, and I would say that what these off this would make a lovely study to to that that is, uh, I think that what they've been doing is partly what you said to basically lend to real estate, lend to all these projects that are, that are have gone bust or that will eventually go bust. But I also think that almost all of the VC funds are also funded by these local financing, the, uh, the local. So I see that I, I, I it, my, uh, my guess is that if you were to get all that data and you were to look at the pro, uh, what they've invested their money in, I think that what, you, what you're going to find is a bimodal distribution. That is, mm -hmm. there are going to be a bunch of projects that I think are, are is, is stuff that you think that the financial sector should be doing and, and a bunch of stuff that looks like, that looks like crony lending. Uh, um, um, 
That's my guess, right? That's my guess. But but the long answer to your question is is that it's think about it as the consequence of this this overlending as as it's coming from the same alliance coupled with financial liberalization in the Chinese way. Uh, so let me conclude with the final question. Um, do you think what the Chinese party does is the optimal thing for them to do, given that I want to stay in control? And secondly, do you think it was a deliberate strategy to two strong hands that having over these two components? Or do you think it just happened to turn out this way and you exposed found this rationalization? Let me answer the second question first. I absolutely believe that it is very much the way I would describe it. I don't think at all it was a deliberate strategy. I think it really is the second thing that you you are de describing. I think what I'm, I mean, I may, the way I present it may sound like it was the deliberate strategy that I don't mean to do that at all. It was very much like to use the Chinese term, uh, crossing the river by touching stones. Uh, it, it, it was very much, I, I think, just trial and error and, and figure out what works and fi figure out what 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 uh, what uh, doesn't work, but I think that is true of almost of like almost everything that you see coming out of China. That I think that 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 very rarely is a plan in this way is a plan in this way, and it's only after the fact that that you start to package it into. I mean, I think you know you started out by talking about the Belt and Road, the Belt, the belt and Road. The way I think about the Belt and Road is that it was primarily a marketing campaign. That it was already going. It was, I think, it's one the other consequence of the fiscal stimulus. That after the fiscal stimulus ended, all these companies then took their projects and they went, mm -hmm. and they basically took their projects abroad. In 2015, then what the central government decided to do is to basically put a ribbon around all these projects and call it a campaign. And many of us then interpreted it as this campaign by the Communist Party to control the world. I, I, when I look at what, what, is, what, what the origin of it, I, I don't think that's a case, that's a case at all. So let me just answer this, that it, I don't think at all it was, a it was a deliberate campaign. I think that the first strong hand, I think very much is a deliberate campaign because that I think was, I, I don't think they call it that, right? They, 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 that's not what they call it. Um, but that, and, but, e but even then, I don't think they decided on all the pieces at the same time. I mean, the first piece was the anti-corruption campaign and all the other pieces was again, crossing the river, right? Crossing the river by, by touch of the song. So it, it, in a sense, I guess to what I'm doing is that I am, yeah, I, I am putting a label, I'm putting a ribbon uh, on, on, on what I see them doing, but it- And, it, and do you think I, it's, it's the optimal strategy for the Chinese Communist Party? Or given just, what goal? Uh, given the goal, you want to stay in control, and you don't want to ruin the economic growth. I mean, you have to keep, as you said, keep economic growth going. Otherwise, you also lose power. My own view. Uh, you, you want my, my own view? Uh, uh, yes. I. I mean, my own personal view is it absolutely is the wrong strategy. It absolutely the wrong is, strategy. My, it's absolutely is a wrong is is a wrong is a wrong. I. I mean. I think it, it comes back to sort of this, I'm going to call it this new, this new eroticism of the party that, mm -hmm. that, that you either have complete control over everything or you die or you die. That I think is just, I mean, that is sort of fundamental to the DNA of the party. Mm -hmm. My own belief is that it's absolutely nuts. Right, but it's a way that they it's a way that they think, it's a way that they think, and and you know, I I respect how everybody thinks, but in my own personal view, I, I think that's just a crazy view of the world. I mean, you know, I believe in freedom, I I, I believe in, in freedom. I think that there are ways in which you can do what you want to do while still giving people their freedom. Right? Uh, 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 I mean, what is it? It's liberal democracy, right? It's uh, the, the uh, uh, so you don't think so this strategy makes it harder to stay within one unified global economy Do you think that makes makes a bipolar world more likely as well or because you have on the one hand you have more yeah 
or is this independent? We can still have a lot of trade and- uh, It's a great question, right? It's, it's a great question, Marcus, and I've been struggling with this. Um, let me refer to you in 2019, Janos Kornai wrote this op-ed in the Financial Times the title something like, I have created a Frankenstein. And if you know something about Janos Hornai, he was instrumental in the first 10 years of Chinese reform. Mm -hmm. uh, he was one of the people behind sort of the design of their price liberalization strategy. There was this famous week long boat ride down the Yangtze River in 1985, where all the young Chinese, all the young Chinese reformers hammered out their plan. And Janos was invited on that boat ride. Was a, 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 and, and then Janos wrote and basically said, look, you know, I thought back in 1985 that I was doing something good, right? But what I've done, what he said is that I've created this Frankenstein, which is that, by which he means it's this rich country, but with a particular political structure and it's, it's become a Frankenstein. And I don't know the answer to, to, to that. Well, I guess, would I say that? I, I don't know. I, I don't know. So, so it's, it's, it's the, I, I think it is the fundamental question that, that faces us, right? It, that, 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 that face of, we all understand about the gains from trade. We, we all, you know, so that, that's well understood. The question is, what are you willing to trade off, right? What are you willing? I mean, it's sort of the same dilemma that Europe is facing, Germany is facing with respect to Russia now, right? Uh, that, that there are gains from trade, but uh, what else are you, are, are, are you trading off? So the question is, what, and th this is beyond my pay scale, which is, what are the implications of the world for having, if we, if this vision works, right? Uh, the, what, what are the implications for the world if the, the, the most powerful country economically in the world is this Leninist structure as well, right? And uh, good. So with this big open question, I don't know. Uh, I, I, I I don't know. We will come back once you have answered or found a solution yeah. uh, to that. This was a very fascinating. I think it's very nice to you know put a ribbon around it and have the big vision and conceptual vision. Uh, what's going on? I think I really appreciate that, and I really like it. Um, so thanks to you and thanks to all the participants. And next week we will talk about. Uh, how we can actually make oil purchases more efficient, in particular by having a purchasing board in contrast to OPEC. So how to design uh, the best way to purchase energy. And Silva Shizang will present uh, next Thursday. So thanks again. All right. And, uh, thanks. Talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye.